Welcome mercenaries into our deep dive of the Beastmaster. Have you ever wanted to play a gritty low fantasy version of Pokemon? Well, honestly, there's probably half a dozen indie games. I have no idea what they are, so you could try this instead. We've got 10 different tameable animals, six unique skill trees, a specialty build for the archer who is going to officially take up the mantle of Beastmaster. And we even have a unique item set with animal companion synergies courtesy of our friends in the Trackers Guild. Oh, and I thought I was being ambitious last time when I covered all the level 8 character skills in a single video we have so much to go over today we're going to be beginning with the animal companions they steal the show starting with fozzy here representing all of bear kind the bears are my pick for the most effective animal companions that you can recruit let's see what they've got Fozzie here hits like a truck, is capable of shrugging off tremendous damage, and eats like an American. I mean, seriously, this guy eats as much as a pack of three wolves, so he's going to have to do something truly special to justify that much of an investment. Is he able to do it? Well, Fozzie, take it away. <laughs> Whoa, 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 Fozzie, leave some for the rest of us. How is the bear putting up these kind of numbers? Well, it all starts with his enormous raw stats, which make incredible use out of a bonus attacks, opportunity attacks, and stat buffs. Beginning with the basic attack, we've got Monstrous Swipe deals a 67 to 86 damage to the target if already engaged in combat. This unit gains Relentless. The Relentless status effect is after attacking, this unit executes an attack of opportunity for free, I meaning you get this double attack off the basic, and this status is removed if no longer engaged in combat. This attack is using about 60 to 90% of our strength as damage, and it's important to remember that our attacks of opportunity deal 105% of our strength value as damage, so we get a lot more work out of the opportunity attacks than we do out of this basic. Before we take any skills off the skill tree, we also have the passive Wild Tenacity. When this unit should die, it gains Berserk and survives. If it already has Berserk, then it dies. And the Berserk status effect increases your damage and damage taken by 100%. This free death save to be able to save your investment in your bear is really incredible. There are some shenanigans you can play around trying to trigger Berserk for the damage increase, but I think that's just giving your character a death wish, and it's nice to have in our back pocket. We can now play more aggressively with our bear, pushing them into the middle of combat situations where otherwise we wouldn't be comfortable with them being because we know that we have this death save in our back pocket. The build really starts to sing once we take our level up. So we've got Intimidating Growl at level 3. This costs a Valor Point. It taunts the enemy and applies Fragility to them, increasing the damage they take by 30% for one round. This is amazing for amping up your damage, and crucially, it counts as a melee attack. Even though this does no damage, and it will trigger an extra attack of opportunity out of Relentless. Popping down to level 5, we take King of the Forest. If starting a battle in the forest, this unit has Galvanization, increasing your damage by 50%. Now, forest does not completely dominate the maps, but it is present in all of the regions, and enemies gravitate toward the forest. It's very easy to be able to try and set up combat in the forest, so we're going to be able to see a lot of use out of this passive. Finally, at level 8, we grab Feral Vitality. This unit attacks of opportunity ignore the enemy's guard. I've already said the attacks of opportunity are one of our main sources of damage. Being able to completely ignore the defense value of the enemies just helps us do so much incredible damage. And a key here is that not only are we triggering attacks of opportunity out of Relentless, but our Beastmaster Archer has the command attack here, which is going to allow us to trigger even more attacks of opportunity and stack few Fury on top of galvanized and vulnerable enemies could just do insane things. To top the build off, we're going for the Infused Collar here. At the end of Fozzie's turn, he will heal 10% of his maximum health. Because he has such an enormous health bar, he's actually going to heal quite a bit, and this is going to help mitigate the fact that we can't get a guard value on him or any armor. Oh man, armored bears. Maybe in a future update we'll be able to get that. None of the other collars really jump out to me as being very important for the bear. Some of them are going to increase your damage a little bit, but his damage is just fine. And being able to get this heal tank at the front lines of your party with a wild tenacity and berserk able to save him if things get really out of hand is incredibly powerful. 
I think this setup is the best way to build your bear companions, but for completeness sake, we should touch on the other skills as well. And it's important to note that while your companions can respec their skills at the new companions camps, your animal companions cannot. So you want to be careful which skills you take here. They are permanent for that animal. At level 3, we're looking at Cozy Pelt. Any companion spending their rest next to this unit generates one Valor Point extra and is limited to one companion per bear. This effectively makes Fozzie into an extension of the tent, and I don't have enough companions to max out the tent right now, so I feel that that is a very weak ability. At level 5, we have another utility skill, Master Fisher. You have a chance to catch wild fish while walking near bodies of water. My understanding is that this is currently bugged and does not trigger as often as it should. Even if it did trigger quite often, water is not very prevalent across the maps. Um, and we're just not going to be able to make a significant source of food to counteract this consumption. And when you're stacking it up against being able to get galvanization for the entire duration of a battle in the forest, there's no competition here. We take King of the Forest every time. Also, if you find that your bear's consumption is just wearing out your party and not able to support all of them, there is a solution to this that we're going to touch on later when we get to the mosquitoes. Finally, at level 8, we passed up on Indomitable, and I think this actually is a pretty good skill. These two are fairly close in terms of power level. Indomitable would increase our strength and constitution by 10%. Because we have such high lump sums in both of those categories, that 10% increase would be impactful. It would be very nice to be able to have but I'm grabbing Feral Vitality just because of how often the opportunity attacks can trigger on Fozzie, and I like being able to send out those huge haymakers to cut through the enemy rather than adding on just a little bit to all of my attacks. As we wrap up our discussion on the Battle Bear, it is worth mentioning that you can get Bear Companions extremely early in the game. If you were to start a party in Tiltron, which I think is the easiest and best region to start in, you want to grab five rope out of the Tiltron Jail, because that is how much rope is required to tame one of these animals, then travel south, past the Haven, past the Rat Infestation, through the Secret Pass, into the Marshes of Harag, and then once you're here in Luden, it's a quick hop on up to be able to get to Fat Claw Cave where there is a guaranteed encounter with a set of bears. You can capture your openers right there and then travel on back. The reason that you would want to take this pass on through is because then you get to avoid the border crossing fee uh, for both Vertrus and Ludern. After picking up your bear companion, you can hop right over to where this marker is on the hill above the official border crossing, and there you're going to be able to find a secret encampment that will give you a full set of tracker equipment with animal companion synergies. Dropping a python there will allow you to cross back and forth for free, uh, but at that point, if you are rushing it at the very beginning of the game, I honestly recommend just going back into Tiltron and uh, just stomp on everybody with your battle bears. Wolfie here is looking fierce and stacking up wolves against the bears. While I think the wolves are not quite as effective overall as the bears, their consumption is lower and they are more accessible to low-level parties, but we are going to touch on them a little bit later once we have a full set to be able to show off the power of their pack tactics. Now, right now, we are going to be going into the piggies. These guys are the most fleshed out animal type with three unique species all tied to the same skill tree. Each pig is going to have its own basic attack, stat line, and consumption value. The basic boar lives up to its name with one of the most boring basic attacks in the entire game. It just deals 10 to 12 damage to the target. That is 40, 45 to 50 percent of their strength, so a terrible ratio. They don't have good stats overall. These guys are the worst of the three species to pick up. Next up, the dominant sow has the most powerful raw stat line, though not by much. Their basic attack is Savage Impalement, deals at 23 to 29. So here we're getting all the way up to 100% of their strength value damage to the target. Critical hit is guaranteed if the target is already engaged with an ally. And the key here is that this is any ally, not just other allied animals, because some of these animal traits are going to carry off of only the allied animals and not everybody. If you want the piggy who will deal the most burst damage, then this is the species for you. But I think we can all agree we see way too many of these in real life. So let's get them out of our fantasy game. The best pig to recruit is the croc swine. Their stat line is not that much better than the basic boar, but their consumption is higher. So we have to look at the basic infectious bite deals 14 to 19 damage to the target and applies bleeding. If the target is already bleeding, then applies poison. 
bleeding is incredible. I look for it every single chance that I can get, and the fact that they are able to apply it just guaranteed point and click is very useful. It boosts their DPS a lot. And then the fact that we get to apply stacks of poison for additional attacks against bleeding targets, meaning that if we have an overabundance of bleeding effects, then we still get extra use on top of the damage of Infectious Bite. The application of this damage over a time effect puts the Crocswine over the other two in my book. It's worth mentioning also that we are dealing with some different passives here. We have Swamp Guardian for the Crocswine when they die, then we get a spawn of a swarm of mosquitoes, and out of the two other boars, we have Forest Guardians, meaning that when allied animals die, they will gain fury. Neither of these passives are any good for us. They are mostly there to be able to spice up the combat encounters against hordes of enemy boars. But we are being very thorough here in our Beastmaster deep dive, so now let's get to that skill tree. At level 3, we've got Thick Skin, reducing the damage taken by 25%, and Hairy Creature. Each time this unit receives a critical hit, it gains Repost. The biggest weakness to animal companions I find is their fragility, because besides the ponies, you can't give them any armor value, so... If one of our piggies was to take a couple critical hits, they're just going to die and we're not going to get very much use out of this repose counterattack. So we grab for thick skin, being able to increase their effective health pool, just being able to slap on a 25% guard value, especially when we look at some of the healing factors that can be provided to the pigs. This is really worth it. Down to level 5, Good Companion. This unit can be assigned to the Campfire versus Cart Boar. Carrying capacity is increased by 20. With the new Pony skill tree, I'm finding that my party has no issues with carrying capacity anymore. Otherwise, Cart Boar would have been more appealing. Uh, so I'm grabbing Good Companion. This unit can be assigned to the Campfire. That means that they're able to generate an extra happiness for the party every single night as your other party members go off to be able to work other jobs, say at the tent to be able to produce valor points or actually sit at the workshop to give you repair materials or raw materials at the cooking pot to reduce food consumption etc etc it just opens up other options to be able to keep your happiness high which is mostly just funneling into my pool of influence right now neither of these abilities are very impactful but i take a good companion at level 8, we're looking at Livestock Boar. This unit can now be slaughtered for meat. The beast eats the remains, which reduces its food's consumption by 2. We also have Truffle Boar. You have a chance to collect mushrooms while walking in the forest. Both of these are directly reducing the food consumption of our animal companion here. My understanding is that the animal foraging abilities don't stack if you have multiples with the same passive ability. So because I'm running only a single boar here, I'm grabbing Truffle Boar because the mushrooms that they find each provide two units of food and your boar is going to find between one and three. When they get the bunch, it will be able to trigger daily. So this is producing more food for me than livestock boar as long as I do um, run through the forest at least once every day, which is pretty easy to be able to work out. The livestock boar puts this image of my mind of a party that abandons use of any of the ponies and you're recruiting boars instead, which are way cheaper and you're putting cart boar and livestock boar on them so their food consumption of the little guys goes down to just two per day and then they also have excellent carrying capacity and they are more useful in battle at least by a little bit than the ponies because ponies are terrible in combat I could see that being fun to play around with, but because you can only pick up Livestock Boar at level 8, that means it's a late game kind of ability, and in the late game, I don't have issues with carrying capacity, and I don't have issues with money being able to afford more ponies. The final word on the pigs then is to recruit Crocswine, grab a Thick Skin, Good Companion, Truffle Boar, and then for the accessory, I'm throwing on the Infused Collar, same as with the bears. While they don't have nearly as much constitution as the bears to be healing nearly as much from the Infused Collar, they do have the built-in guard value, so their effective health pool is a little bit larger, and most of the damage for the Crocswine is coming off of the applications of Bleeding and Poison, so the other collars that would be messing around with their damage in different ways don't interest me nearly as much. Politician here is going to be the spokesman for all the cardinal mosquitoes, and if you're just too grossed out, you can check the timestamps to jump ahead. I don't blame you. To recruit mosquitoes, you have to utilize the specialty Harag Concoction offhand weapon, giving you the spray skill that will damage mosquitoes significantly, and if they are taken out with the spray, then they will be captured instead of killed. You can acquire this item by going through the Cursed Village of Cersei. I believe I'm saying that right. You can see the full breakdown of all of the loot there out of my guide to Ludurn. The Mosquito's basic attack is Terrible Sting, deals a little bit of damage to the target's health, the damage ignores guards, and critical hits apply Fever. 
Because the tooltip calls out that this is damage to the target's health, this ignores their armor value entirely, and because the damage ignores guard, it is never going to be reduced. Critical hits also applying fever is nice, but it's not really going to be impacting the damage coming out of this or our team. The real key to the Mosquito playstyle is Blood Drinker passive. Each time this unit deals damage, gains one application of Blood Reserve, and once you reach two applications, the unit completely regenerates their health. This can make Mosquitoes extremely durable in spite of having really low constitution, and the key here is that because it's tied to this passive, it applies any time they deal damage, meaning that you can use your Beastmaster Archers with the command attack to be able to proc it faster if you're in danger of losing your Mosquito. Flipping to the skill tree at level 3, we're looking at a Life Drain versus a Bloody Thrill. Life Drain, each time this unit deals damage, it heals for half of the damage inflicted. We already have incredible healing baked in on every other attack, so why do we care about a percentage of their tiny auto attack damage? Bloody Thrill is better each time this unit heals itself, it gains Fury, increasing the damage of its next attack by 50%. Now, because their attacks are so weak, this is still not going to be great, uh, but I take Bloody Thrill over Life Drain. At level 5, we're looking at Power Reserve, damage increased by 50% for each stack of Blood Reserve. You have to remember that this is going to get reset every time you hit 2, so you're never really going to get that much work out of this passive. It is up against the Venomous Sting. Each attack also applies a one poison. Being able to add in some percent health damage is what's really going to help our DPS out. So I go for Venomous Sting, though one poison is nothing to write home about either. At level 8, we've got Stimulating Transfusion. This unit grants Fury to a nearby companion during a rest, and this is up against Bloodletting. This unit can sting a companion to remove their need for food during the next two meals. Are you trying to run an entire army of bears and you're not able to feed them? Well then, Bloodletting is the way to go. So this is your utility out of combat if you guys are really struggling on being able to feed your party. And then Stimulating Transfusion is going to give you just a little bit of a pump up uh, for combat. My picks for the Mosquito are Bloody Thrill and Venomous Sting and then going down into Stimulating Transfusion. For accessory, I've put on Protective Collar to be able to give them that extra death save though. Honestly, you could put saddlebags here. Nothing is going to make that much of a difference. All in all, Mosquitoes suck, but you guys already knew that, so let's get on to the ponies. These guys are the OG Animal Companion and they have the largest skill tree along with a unique armor slot for horse armor. Man, I can almost feel the devs elbowing Bethesda in the ribs over this one. We have three levels of Pony Plate. Light Pony Plate, which is going to give you the lowest armor value, but increase your movement by two. Medium Pony Plate for the middle ground, and then up to Heavy Pony Plate, giving you 58 armor, no guard value, and reducing your movement in combat by two. This does not impact your party's travel speed. This is just hitting the movement of the pony in combat. At level 3, we now get to specialize our ponies between work ponies and war ponies. The war pony means that your pony can now fight and wear armor plating. The work pony is going to increase their carrying capacity by 20. This means that really we have two different skill trees in here. So we're just going to go down the war pony first and then we'll look at the pack ponies afterward. Uh, at level 5, you only have rearing. Applies inspiration to all allies in the area for one round doubling those allies of movement. This is a four meter area. Having it as a utility option is extremely nice with the addition of new battle types where your party is just required to retreat or get across the battlefield as quickly as they can to be able to end the battle, so it's good to be able to have. At level 8, we get to grab Devastating Charge, disengages and charges in a straight line, deals 18 damage to all units along the way, ignoring their guard. The damage on the ponies is so low, I am not interested in paying the Valor Point to be able to get this charge off. The utility here is that you get the free disengage, so if you're trying to save your pony's life and he's about to die, you can be able to just cut and run um, and save your investment in the pony, but uh, if you're worried about losing him, you may as well have not spec'd him into War Pony at all. Your other war pony option at level 8 is Gallop Master. Movement increased by 3. Now, mine already has really good movement to be able to get where he needs to go, so I don't see the movement increase being that useful either. All in all, I feel like the war pony build is kind of a dud. Especially when you look at the power of utility on the work pony side. The work pony is going to be able to increase their carrying capacity by 20, so goodbye carry weight issues. 
Then at level 5, you're looking at Tireless, the troops fatigue increases 10% more slowly versus Vigor, run duration increased by 15%. Now, I'll let the Redditors and the people in the comments debate which one of these is mathematically superior. I've just split the difference with two work ponies and each taken one. It's very hit and miss whether or not the troop movement speed on the world map is broken right now or is actually working. Um, right now, it appears that the pony skills are working, so take your pick. It also appears that they do stack. Finally, here at level 8, we get plane runner movement speed in the world increased by 5%. And once again, this is one of the points where there seems to be an issue with either parties hitting a max or these abilities are not fully implemented to actually change your troops movement speed on the world map. So which way do I recommend to build your ponies? Well, if you're only considering the game state right now, the pack pony is vastly superior to the war pony. I really don't get any use in battle out of the war pony, uh, even though the pony armor is nice to be able to keep them alive. Uh, you may as well just have them as a pack pony and never risk them in the first place. But if we open up our third eye and scry into the future of early access, what is development going to bring us? Well, we know we're going to get level 12 skills. We have no idea how powerful these are going to be. This could completely revolutionize how good the war pony is. And because of how long it takes to level up ponies, because you're not able to catch them in the wild at a high level, and because you cannot respec animal companions, it could be worth it to keep a war pony around just to be prepared when this level 12 drops. Also, the developers have said that they are thinking very seriously on if they are going to implement mounted units. What if the level 12 skill for your war pony lets somebody ride them? That could immediately make the War Pony the best character in your entire party, able to give you a cavalry unit. We really have no idea. It's pure speculation on how or if mounted units are ever going to be added to the game, but I'm playing it safe by keeping a War Pony in my back pocket and trying to max out their level to be prepared in case any crazy things come out down the line with the next update. Here is our wolf pack build in all of its glory. We have three level 9 wolves led by a level 9 alpha. The wolves and the alpha have slightly different build paths. I'm going to explain why that is and how I might change it if I was to build up the pack yet again. The wolves all have a basic attack dealing 44 to 55 damage to the target. Very boring ability. It does, uh, what is this, 80... 80 to 100% of their strength as damage. Nothing special there, but the beautiful synergy comes in with the sharp fangs passive that the wolves and the alpha all have. Each attack against the unit without armor applies bleeding. While not as good as the Crocswine ability to always apply bleeding, this is still really nice and synergizes with the rest of their build. The Alpha's ability, Ferocious Bite, deals 55 to 70 damage to the target, and a critical hit is guaranteed if the target is bleeding. This means that the alpha can really feed off of all these stacks of bleed that the rest of the pack are supposed to be putting out. Or if you have, say, a harpooner or a crocswine, you can really tee up some beautiful critical hits to the alpha. Now, all of our wolf buddies have taken the pack passive. If there are at least three wolves in the troop, this unit's critical hit is increased by 50. Just a raw 50. This is amazing. We see here he's generating 9 as a base value and plus 50% from the pack passive means that we're going to be critting 60% of the time with guaranteed crits on bleeding targets. That's why all of our wolves have also taken the Tooth Collar, increasing their critical damage by 10%. The Strength skill is also going to be amping up that critical damage, so being able to pick up the passive to increase their critical hit is very nice. A couple things to note on this pack passive. When it says you have to have three wolves in the party, it literally means three wolves, which are the base level species, not alphas. If you have three alphas, then you're not going to be able to trigger this. Also, they just have to be in the party. They don't have to take the pack skill themselves. So you could run a split of pack on the ones that you want to be critting, and you could divert a few over into self-sacrifice if you want. Self-sacrifice says while this unit is not engaged in combat but is near an ally, it gains fragility but gives protection to the ally. Fragility damage taken increased by 30%, protection damage taken reduced by 30%. 
If I was to build the pack over again, I would take at least one wolf with self-sacrifice. I could run them at the center of the pack, and then they would be able to give this pseudo armor buff to all the guys around them while themselves being extremely fragile, but because of how large the animal bases are, it's fairly easy to make sure that one of them would stay safe. It would decrease that specific wolf's DPS by cutting away that 50% chance to critical hit, um, but giving that protection out to everybody else would be so nice. Our Alpha has taken Licking Wounds. This unit is healed for 30% of its max health and all of its debuffs are removed. This costs one Valor Point and it has to be done while you are not engaged in combat. This is a beautiful ability for making sure your wolf remains healthy, being able to cleanse along with the heal. That combo is what makes this so powerful. Now it's squaring off against Carnivore Diet, which is a passive each time this unit kills an enemy, it heals itself for 50% of its maximum health, which I have given to all of the little wolves. I am doing this because I feel like I don't really want to spend Valor points on keeping them alive, and so having the Carnivore Diet just potentially triggering for free to be able to keep them topped up might be enough to be able to see them through. If you really want to keep your pack alive and are willing to spend the Valor points to make sure that happens, then Licking Wounds is going to be more reliable, um, but because Carnivore Diet is free and we're running a lot of wolves here, we're taking Carnivore Diet on the little guys. Finally, we've got Natural Born Hunter versus Guard Wolf. Natural Born Hunter, this unit has a chance to catch wild game during a rest. Honestly, this ability is a bit of a dud. You only get one unit of venison as far as I've seen. It triggers about 50% of the time and it doesn't stack for having multiple wolves that have taken the ability. All my wolves have. Um, I'm still only gaining that little bit of venison. Guard Wolf says if your troop is attacked during a rest, it is immune to surprise and this unit gains galvanization. My party is basically never attacked by surprise. I don't find that to be a uh, issue for my group at all, so I've not taken any Guard Wolves. I wish that it would also decrease your chance of being attacked during the night. Uh, so everybody's gone at a natural born hunter just for that little bit of utility that skill is giving me. All in all, the wolf build is very good. Their damage with the crit build is extremely high. If you're making the comparison of the upkeep cost of three wolves with the crit build versus the single bear, then the wolves are going to be doing a lot more damage. It's just that you're going to have to expect uh, be okay with losing a few and the bear is so tanky especially with the healing on him he's going to be able to sustain a lot more damage and be a lot more reliable in surviving whereas the wolves you got to be careful playing around the flanks trying to keep them topped up with the licking wounds or through scoring kills um, and it just doesn't always quite work out to keep them alive the final animal skill tree we have to look at is the rats and this is mostly a meme build right Right now it doesn't even show my Plagued Rat. Uh, I think that this would only work if you were on fixed difficulty. If you're playing scaled difficulty, uh, then these guys are absolute garbage. But they have mechanics that allow you to generate more rats and create a pseudo swarm, which on the fixed difficulty setting might have some advantages for you. Let's talk about what we've got here. Plague Rat here has Infectious Bite, it does damage, and then it will also apply one stack of Fever to the enemy, increasing their damage taken by 10%, and that can stack infinitely throughout the battle. They also have the Plagued Organism passive, so they deal, or they receive extra damage from fire, and poison damage actually heals them. Their stats are extremely low, low constitution, low strength. We'll talk about why I have a level 2 rat here in a second, but in a world where you are pairing this with a poison-based ranger build, you could get a lot of healing across a swarm of higher level rats who can maybe survive one hit from an enemy. That's kind of iffy. The plagued rats are definitely within the one-shot range of any enemy type. Again, on the fixed difficulty setting with a swarm of them, you might be able to get some work out of this. Across from them, the mole rats have nibbling. It also does damage, and if the target is already engaged with an ally, the damage is increased by 50%. Very low damage overall, but they get this force multiplier in numbers, which is also accentuated with their strength in numbers passive. Damage increased by 25% for each allied mole rat within 6 meters. Now, this is locked to mole rats, so Mixing and matching your rats doesn't really give you much benefit, um, and the UI has a helpful little uh, tooltip there to tell you how much of a boost you are receiving. So in a full swarm here, 
you might get meaningful damage if you have them all surrounding an enemy and then you give them command attack. I could see some decent numbers coming out. You also have Cover of Darkness here, which is really interesting because this is paired with the Tomb of the Ancient Light and Darkness mechanics, but only Torchlight is light. Otherwise, they're always considered to be in darkness, so they will always have brutality when you take them out of the tombs as long as the enemies aren't carrying torches and as long as you're not carrying torches. Hopping over to the skill tree at level 3 we've got Snooper. This unit has a chance to find cheese while visiting various places. This is actually excellent. It procs fairly often. You get a nice little slab of cheese and because their consumption is so low you're actually generating a net positive food production for the party. Now as with all of these food production passives they don't stack. So having a whole army of rats just find you loads and loads of cheese to feed everybody is not going to be able to happen. The other option here is carry an eater if this unit kills an enemy. I don't know how you're going to manage that, but then their food consumption is canceled for the next meal, so you're just canceling two food consumption. Yeah, this one is a throwaway. Down at level 5, we have Call of the Swarm. This was initially bugged. <laughs> and would call in extra rats on the enemy's side. Now that's supposed to be fixed, but you're still only able to use it if you're at less than 50% health. You get to call on a unit of its type, so you get another rat in to help you. You can only use it if you're at half health or less. Um, it, not very often that your little rats are gonna be at half health. Most often they're just gonna go 100 to zero. So good luck being able to use this. This, I believe, takes away their action. I'm trying to remember the last time that I used this. I believe that you will not be able to attack, but it is a free skill. It doesn't cost you valor points and it generates another. So in a situation where you put the, um, the death save collar on all of these guys, you could get in a position where you can use this ability over and over to generate your spam of rats. Your other option here is survival of the species. If two units of the same species have this skill, they have a chance to reproduce and spawn another unit after rest. Ho oh, ho, this is where I was hoping the rat swarm dream would be realized and it is not. This is a terrible, terrible ability. It only triggers about 50 to 33% of the time and the baby rat comes out at level one. What are you supposed to when your party has level five, level eight characters and suddenly you get a baby rat at level one? <laughs> He's gonna do nothing. He gets no skills. He has no health. He has no damage. Absolute garbage. At level eight, we're looking at Nocturnal Growling. This unit has Plague Rat enraged at night. So during nighttime, you will be able to increase your damage by 30% or you can take Remarkable Organism. This unit cannot die from damage caused by bleeding, poison, or burning. I am not putting very much value on nighttime damage increase by 30% when their damage is already so low. The Remarkable Organism is the way to go just because it gives them that slight chance of surviving. You can also finagle this by inflicting bleeding, poison, burning etc on them on purpose to be able to bring them to a low enough threshold to use call of the swarm if you want to multiply your rat numbers um, and then you can just keep on popping out call of the swarm for these guys who are super low and have been taken low because of damage over time effects but will never die because of those damage over time effects i think that any way you build a rat swarm it's going to be bad mole rats are probably the best way to go because they're just slightly more durable and hit a little bit harder they also get the force multiplier on their damage so most often with my animal swarms i like to be able to get a lot positioned around the same enemy that's going to amp up their damage and then they get the command attack from the beast master giving them fury amping up their damage to try and bring down this single target they're just so squishy and they do so little. At least they don't consume very much food. If you have already cleared the Tombs of the Ancients and you're wondering how you could possibly get mole rats back into the party, if you fight the Ludern trackers, so either attacking the guards or taking the missions to go after the so-and-so's packs at the tavern contracts, then you will fight against the trackers. Now they don't have mole rats in the party, but they do have other animal companions and their passive skill is that when their initial animal companions take a turn, they call in another animal companion to assist them in battle and that can be a completely random animal 
most often I see a couple mole rats come out of those battles. So you can capture those at the level of the trackers that you are fighting, and then you can build up your army of mole rats from there. All animal skill trees out of the way, let's talk about the archer's build who is going to be officially taking up the subclass of beast master. You pick that up at level three right here, giving you the command attack ability, a single valor point to be able to get all allied animals next to a target to attack them with an attack of opportunity. And then if you level this up with a skill mastery tome, all of those animals will gain fury right before their attack. I'm actually not sure why the tooltip hasn't updated. Oh, I'm looking at it on the wrong screen. Over here, once it's upgraded, the improved version will appear. Then dropping down to level five, you get beast mastery. Animals can be controlled directly in battle. This is a must if you're gonna run a lot of animals in your party. Otherwise they just suicide charge straight into the enemies and are more frustrating than they're worth. Before we go into the weeds of what the best level eight skill for a beast master is, I want to mention that you do get benefit of having multiple beast masters in the party because at level five, not only can animals be controlled in battle, but they will also heal 5% of their maximum health at the end of the archer's turn. So if you take several beast masters, you're going to get more healing across your animals, especially useful if you have a couple bears who are really going to be able to be health tanks for the team. Also, even if you're not interested in doubling up on the healing and you want to go into some of these other passive abilities, you can grab beast master and then go into anything else and have that command attack out of the other archers to be able to get a lot of attacks of opportunity out, especially from your bears. Again, the bear getting an attack of opportunity for a single valor point also amped up with fury is certainly worth the valor point. Okay, what is the best level eight skill for your beast master? We've got three skills, all of which I think could be viable, well, except for Taming Arrow right now. It is still bugged as far as I am aware. It only targets enemies. It's meant to target allies to be able to give them fury at the point where they fix it. This, I think, is going to be the best skill for your beast master. Being able to give fury for free, the key here is that there is no valor point cost. Free fury to an animal companion, I take that. Right now, I think the best skill to take for the Beastmaster is actually Thrill of the Hunt, the one that <laughs> does not have animal synergy. Each attack executed at a distance of more than 8 meters grants one Rage. Rage will stack 5% increase to your damage for the entire battle. I think that this is just really good, really reliable, easy to be able to proc, and is going to increase the damage out of your bow, which if you're using the right bow, is going to be hitting very hard out of the Beastmaster. We'll touch on equipment in a second. Can animal affinity measure up to the raw stat increase of Thrill of the Hunt? Here, at the start of the battle, you gain the passive skill of one allied animal. Well, actually, when you improve this with a Mastery Tome, you get the passive skill of two allied animals. Most of the animal passives are absolutely useless on the archer, so if you're running a party with a widespread of different animals, don't take this ability. You're going to get shuffled in some random junk, and it's going to feel really bad. But there are a few that you can key off of that the archer can actually make use of. You can gain wild tenacity off the bears instead of dying you get a death save and then your unit goes berserk so not very helpful for most of the battle but very reassuring to have in your back pocket wolves giving you sharp fangs so you apply bleeding on targets without any armor could occasionally see some use i don't see that as very useful on the archer the mole rats in a mole rat swarm might actually have the best passive increasing damage by 25% for each allied mole rat within six meters. Six meters is a fairly large space. If your archer has this and you put him in the center of a swarm of these guys, he could be hitting at easily double, triple his normal damage one-shotting enemies with this passive, but that's a huge amount of effort to be able to get that to work. The only other passive I think bears mentioning is the Forest Guardian passive out of the basic boars. When an allied companion dies, the unit gains fury. If you're running with a swarm of boars and your archer is able to pick that up, he's probably going to get a little bit of use out of it. But all in all, I don't think that is a very good level 8 passive to take on the Beast Master. Let me know in the comments if you guys have theory crafted a build around being able to get a lot of use out of that ability. Let's talk equipment. The trackers have equipment options with special animal synergies, the best of which is the tracker's bow right here. You get guaranteed critical hits if the target you're shooting at is engaged with an allied animal. This is incredibly easy to be able to get to go off and just boost your DPS out of your Beast Master by quite a bit. Next up is the Tracker's Axe giving you wild marking. It deals 60 to 120% of strength damage to the target and applies marked for death. Every time this unit is attacked by an animal, the damage increases. 
This is a one-handed weapon for your warrior to wield, and it is actually a four meter attack. This is a ranged attack for the warriors. Extremely interesting to think about how putting in these different equipment options can change melee only classes into mid-range options. I think that's really cool that they've brought this in as a ranged attack. Unfortunately, I really like my warriors using two-handed weapons far and away better than the one-handed options, and this thing's damage is just so low it's going to require coordination with allied animals to be able to bring the dps up to what you're losing from bringing just a two-handed axe on your warrior but the saving grace is that the trackers also have a shield that is going to apply deflection to animals that end or that is nearby the warrior when the warrior ends his turn in this situation where you're building a warrior to be a designated character to hold the hands of the animal companions he's got the shield the one-handed axe he's applying marks for death He's giving deflection to everybody around him. They advance as a unit and just overwhelm enemies, especially if he's standing next to a couple bears. You can throw them right into the middle of combat. They're going to be so durable. They'll tank anything the enemy has to throw at them. That can be a really good build. The final thing I'll say on equipment is that I think the tracker's knife might be the best non-legendary knife in the game, giving you slaughter deals 48 to 60 damage to the target and you gain three rage increasing your damage by 15 percent every time you attack with this is just so good it is no animal synergies but i wanted to call it out because i am loving using this guy my number one tip for managing your animal companions and getting the most power and stats out of them is capture new higher level companions rather than level up the ones that you've got. So here we've got Wolfie, my level eight alpha wolf. He's been with me since level six. His stat line here, 51 strength, 148 constitution. We're up against a level nine wolf pack that we just met out here in the wild. Wolfie, our alpha, remember, is squaring off against a basic wolf here with 59 strength and 157 constitution. This means that the basic wolf at level nine has a better stat line than a level eight alpha. If we look over at this pack's alphas, we're looking at 83 strength and 225 constitution. Oh, let's see how long it would take to grind up 8,040 experience to be able to carry Wolfie to level 9. And remember, he cannot be tasked at the training dummy to expedite his leveling process. Capturing this alpha at level 9 then is an immediate, enormous improvement in my wolf companion's performance. Now I know, a lot of people get very attached to their companions and their animal companions. They never want to see them die. They're going to restart battles, save scum, do everything it takes to be able to keep everybody alive every single time. And if you want to do that, then more power to you. But uh, what I certainly prefer to do is uh, capture the higher level guys, rename them to the exact same name as the old animal companion that I then dismiss, and theater of the mind, imagine that it's the same creature the whole time. Let me know in the comments what tricks you guys have been using to get the most out of your animal companions. The last tip that I want to leave you guys with here today is that you can teach any of your animal companions the basic set of skills. So I have turned Black Friday here into the ambulance pony. Wrath is a no-brainer onto your bears. And Run and Taunt certainly have their places as well if you are willing to spend the valor points out of your animals. Let me know what animal has been your favorite to tame and turn into your battle minions, and if anything you saw in this video has gotten you inspired to recruit a new type of animal and give them a try. Leave a like if the video was helpful, and subscribe to stay tuned for more War Tales content soon to come. We will also be diving into the developer's brand new game, Dune the Spice Wars, as soon as that releases, so I'm very excited for what is to come. Till next time, thank you guys for watching, and have a good one.